The history of brewing and distilling spirits locally dates back to the arrival of the first permanent settlers. Many of the pioneers did not have access to fresh, clean spring water and continued the colonial tradition of brewing ale or beer for a drink that was safe to consume. A jug of whiskey was also an item found in most pioneers' inventory. As much of the early settlers' labors were communal, whiskey at the end of a workday was reward for their endeavors and strengthened the social bond of the community. Most pioneers converted surplus corn into whiskey for economic reasons. Whiskey was more convenient to store and transport, and in the barter system of the early settlements where hard cash was mostly non-existent, whiskey was an important asset in trading for necessary goods. Commercial brewing had its origins in Anderson immediately after the end of the Civil War. In 1865, Charles Doxey and William Craycraft began a partnership and commenced making beer at the Craycraft property on 8th and Brown Streets. Little is known about the small brewery other than it supplied the tavern at the same location operated by Matthias Colchin. No known artifacts exist for this short-lived brewery, which operated for less than a year before burning down in May of 1866. Doxy and Craycraft chose not to rebuild. And for a short time, Anderson was without the benefit of a beer brewing establishment. Four months after the loss of Doxy and Craycraft's brewery, Thomas Norton and Patrick Sullivan acquired Alonzo Makepeace's four-story grist mill on the west bank of the White River, now the northern end of Central Avenue. The mill was converted into a brewery and operations began. Sullivan soon left the business and Norton formed a partnership with his son-in-law, Michael Crowley. In 1882, Norton assumed full ownership, naming the business Thomas M. Norton Brewery. By the time Thomas Norton retired in 1897, the brewery had $100,000 in capital stock. The brewery was producing 25,000 barrels of beer annually with such brands as Gold Band, Old Pal, and Norton's Special Brew. The brewery also owned its own bottling plant on Main Street between 6th and 7th. In 1890, it had 40 employees and had added a refrigeration unit. Beforehand, the brewery depended on ice cut from White River and local ponds in the winter months. In 1893, Norton Brewery obtained the first telephone in Anderson. The phone number was 1. Also in 1893, Norton's Brewery participated in the Columbian Exposition in Chicago. This is Chet Green with Anderson TV talking with Bill Nepp at the Madison County Historical Society and today we're talking about beer and the bottles that they came in during our wonderful Hoosier past. Bill, what do we have here? Okay, the, the very earliest breweries more than likely didn't have bottles. They sold most of their beer by the keg. But the earliest bottles were black glass like this. They would have been corked at the top and then a wire would have been placed over the, over the cork to hold it in place. And uh, it took a lot, of, a lot of work, a lot of time to do that. And they slowly evolved a, a better way. And the real early stuff, uh, bottles were kind of hard to get. So a lot of, a lot of the earlier ales are, were put up in uh, uh, pottery bottles. This is a Lampin from uh, the Lampin uh, Brewery at uh, Madison, Indiana. One of the very few pottery bottles we have from Indiana. Well, there. This was a little device that they came up with to uh, make uh, bottling uh, ale or beer uh, faster, and this is called a mashed potato stopper. They would put the cork down in the top of the bottle, and then they would bring this back across to hold the cork in place to keep it from 
coming out of the bottle. This is another early ale, and it was one that was discorked and it was also wired. And a, uh, a groove that's around the top of this here was there to hold the wire in place while they, when they wired it. The first big invention that helped with this was what they called the lightning stopper. And that's this metal device here. You push the bottom up, the top comes off. It's got a rubber, rubber plug in here. And when you put it back, fill the bottle, put the stopper back in, and you push the lever down. Pretty similar to the, uh, uh, the type that they used on a lot of ball, early ball jars. The next big advancement was uh, it's what they call a Baltimore loop. If you could run your finger down in the top of this bottle, there's a groove on the inside, and they would uh, push a rubber plug into the top of this bottle to seal it, and that would expand out into that groove. And in order to get your bottle open, open you'd use a corkscrew, and they would... Pull the, pull the cork out. And then the last big advancement was a crown top, which is like they would have on a, uh, a pop bottle or a soda bottle, and that was probably about the, the fastest until they come up with, of course, cans. <laughs> when did the, they actually come up with... Uh Cans. Oh, the when cans. Did, when did they start manufacturing I, cans? I believe it was in the early 19th. Well, it would have had to been uh, shortly before probation, so it would be uh, before 1918. But it, uh, they just uh, put beer into cans just a few years, and then into the 30s they became more popular. Uh, most of the cans then were what they called uh, cone top cans, where it has a funnel type arrangement. I've got one in the exhibit in there. Uh, and then it was opened with a, it was a crown top. And uh, uh, then they came up with the flat top cans, which used a uh, an opener church key to punch a hole in the top of it. Now, did they have any trouble when they opened these? Uh, now, this is the one that That's had a the, uh, loop here. that needed the corkscrew to open, correct? Yeah. And um, with the pressure of carboniz uh, carbonization, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if yeah. that's the proper term, <laughs> Yeah. Um, the carbon dioxide in there is going to build yeah. pressure. Did it pop like a champagne? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's where they came up with the uh, the name of pop bottle. Yeah, a lot of the, a lot of the early sodas, you would push the top down in them, and it's what they called a Hutchison soda, and you'd push the top down on it, and it would make a big pop when it when it broke the seal. I don't uh, don't have any of those in here. Uh, for some reason, they never used those. As far as I know, never used the Hutchison soda stopper on uh, beer or ale. So I don't know why, but they they didn't. So. And with with the lightning style, yeah, uh, there are still. I'm as far as I'm aware, there's still some uh, bottling well, there's manufacturers that still there's use some that, in Europe that do still use that yeah, style. Yes. Yeah, they still use a style. Uh, lightning fruit jar company is the one that uh, got the patent on this, and they also use the same style on their fruit jars. And other fruit companies in uh, well, fruit ball, jar companies. yeah, just changed it a little bit, and quite a few of them had their own version of this this type of a stopper. What are the ages of these bottles? No, well, the black glass bottles can be pretty early. They they can go into the middle 1700s. Ones that are real similar to this, and they were used up until. Uh, around 1830 or so. The pottery bottles out there when dates probably around 1830, 1840. Uh, the, this, this is a dirk from Cambridge City 
it has a mashed potato stopper on it uh, probably around uh, 1850 to 1860 these uh, lightning stoppers uh, late 1880s and they were used up till probably a little after the turn of the century and these the Baltimore loop stopper uh, early 1890s till a little after the turn of the century and the crown tops uh, still using those so they started making them in uh, about late 1890s the first crowns came out but uh, well that's a fantastic overview of kind of the history of the bottles uh, where were most of them manufactured well the glass itself the glass bottles most of the earlier stuff was done uh, in Pennsylvania out east and uh, the later ones uh, we had some that were made here in, in Indiana this here's a Terre Haute Brewing Company uh, and this is a glass works from Terre Haute is who made this one a lot of them will have a glass maker's mark on on the bottom of them I say that and this one doesn't but uh, Well, of course not the one you want. <laughs> no. <laughs> I should have checked before. <laughs> uh, we'll cut that this out. Is a, oh, this is a Agnew and uh, A and DHC. And I can't remember what who was. It's, it's one, I think, from Ohio. Glassworks from Ohio. We've talked about the history of bottling and different styles of bottles in Indiana. What about Anderson specifically and its brewing operations in the 1800s? Well, our first uh, brewery in Anderson was the Doxy Brewing Company, and uh, they were only in business for about five or six months. And Doxy had a long string of fire <laughs> fires. He had a hotel that burnt down. An opera house and a brewery. Unfortunate and, incendiary <laughs> incidents. And he had no had no insurance on on any of them. <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway, apparently T, uh, Thomas uh, Norton found out about the fire. He had a brewery over in uh, Union City, and he'd been there about six years. And his partner over there was Williams. And uh, he uh, sold off his share of the brewery, and he moved to Anderson in 1866 and set up his own brewery here along with a partner uh, by the name of Sullivan. And a few years after he moved here, uh, he took on a new partner by the name of Crawley. Who and, just happened to be his son-in-law. Yeah, well, that's, that's a good way to do it. And... Uh, Anyway, the first bottles from Anderson are the Norton and Crawley ales. And this here one is embossed. Norton and Crawley manufactures 3X Porter and Ale, Anderson, Indiana. And this bottle uh, is a lightning stopper bottle. And it, it would date uh, right around 18, uh, late 1860s, early 1870s. It's a beautiful piece. These are extremely rare bottles. I'm lucky enough to have two of the lightning stopper ones. And I also have, uh, this is the only known 
whole example of this bottle. I've seen one broken one one time, and uh, it's a taper top bottle that took a cork and it was wired down. And this was a little older than than the other the lightning stopper bottles, but it's embossed exactly the same way Norton and Crawley, and uh, it's a little bit larger bottle and a little more volume to it. And this bottle here is one that was here at the Historical Society when I started volunteering up here. And it's a label, an early label beer from uh, Norton Brewing Company. And it's the only, only uh, uh, labeled beer from, uh, early labeled beer that I've ever seen from the Norton Company. And what would you say uh, the age is? Uh, this is probably... Uh, uh, around 1880, 1885. Is that the period when they started using paper labels on? Bottles? No, they uh, they had paper labels on from real early. It's like this: the Norton and Crawley probably had a real nice paper label on the back of it. A lot of your uh, a lot of your earlier beers and ales. Uh, we're not embossed. It's like this one here. There's no embossing on it. It's just, it's just a uh, plain bottle. They were cheaper to make, and and uh, you just put a label on it. <laughs> So, Bill, I see we have some bottles here from the TM Norton Brewing Company, which occurred later in the history of that particular brewery. Uh, we've got three different sizes of bottles. What's uh, the story on those? Well, the large size is a quart beer, and this is probably the most common of the, of the three sizes. This is a pint, and this small bottle is, is a... Uh, called a pony beer or a ladies beer and uh, this here one is extremely rare in, in a Norton uh, really I've only seen this one example of it and it's also uh, well these are Baltimore loop closures on these and the newer ones have the crown tops and they also come in the three sizes and even in it the uh, the uh, small ladies' beer is, is, is really hard to find. Mm -hmm. 